Hey there, gang. This is something a little different. New in my experience, anyway. I'm going to be working on some Russian gooslies. Goosely? I'm not sure if pluralized nouns in Russian have an S on the end. Probably depends on if they're masculine or feminine. And well, Anyway, these are Russian folk harps. Or more accurately, folk zithers. The zither family involves strings that lie parallel to the sound box and don't extend beyond it as opposed to harps, where the strings approach the soundboard at an angle. There are a bunch of Eastern European and Slavic boxes with strings on them. They're an ancient part of the musical culture. Um, there's written references to them in histories of the region from at least 1400 years ago, and certainly good iconographic evidence of them in use um, by the turn of the first millennium. These are having some issues, which I hope won't be too difficult to work through. This one here has a crack in its pin block, it's not holding some of the pins as snug as it should. Um, this setup here where the strings are converging really tightly is probably a design consideration brought about by using a guitar piezo pickup for a bridge. In the larger one, a couple of the holes that uh, house the tuning pins have enlarged and they won't hold tuning. So I'll be drilling those out, plugging and re-drilling for the pins. I think I'll start on the small one here. This strap seems to have been adhered to the side using some adhesive, so I've separated it back just enough that I can get a clamp in there, which I think will probably be necessary. And you can see the crack runs between the saddle slot up between two of these bridge pins. It's following a grain line that runs all the way up to the edge here, so there's some danger that this could at some point crack all the way through and split off and get lost, which would be unfortunate. So it's a good thing we're catching it early in the proceedings. Tuning is affected using these zither pins. They have sort of a square cross section on the top, cylindrical piece that goes down into the wood, and they're adjusted using this tool. It's basically a socket. These are friction fit, and you want to be careful. You don't want to be pushing or pulling them in any direction. Just go light. The strap was going to get in the way, so I removed it. Clamping in a regular shape like this is always a bit of a chore, especially if it involves a curved section like this. You can see if I put a regular clamp across there, there's no perpendicular surface for the jaws to engage with, so they want to slide back and forth, and basically they travel downhill. Uh, the clamping pressure gets misdirected. It's not going to go where we need it. Probably end up like this somehow. So I've decided the best thing to do is to make a small clamping form. This is a little plywood frame in the making here. It's got one wall that's already been placed at right angles. And I'll use a square to figure out the angle I should place the second wall at. And also where I can position a quarter twenty insert so that I can uh, put a screw through this and turn it into a press. I'm using slightly thinned tight bond glue here because I want to get really good penetration. I'll clean the excess up with a Q-tip, put a small cork pad in there to protect the side of the peg box, and then I can screw in the screw, apply the pressure, and then go back and clean up again. Turning my attention to the larger goosley, I'll remove the strings from the malfunctioning pegs and I'll carefully withdraw those from the holes. These pegs have a very, very fine screw thread on them. It's so fine, in fact, that it acts more like a texture than an actual screw. Um, you can see it's almost invisible how tight and how shallow those threads are. So they function more on friction than they do actually screwing into the wood. Looking at the underside here, you can see it's a little bit rough hewn, and the dowel inserts for those pegs go all the way through. The owner speculated that those dowels are actually made of oak, and just checking at that, the cross section, that's definitely end grain oak here. You can see the characteristic medullary rays. I actually happen to have a red oak dowel of the right size, so I feel comfortable using that. Now the pinholes in there are not particularly well centered, so I have to work my way up using smaller diameter drills and kind of zhuzh it one way or the other, trying to get it closer, and um, kind of go up incrementally drill size by drill size until I'm working up to the full size hole which is about 10 millimeters or 3 eighths of an inch. It should fit nice and snugly. 
Go back and apply glue, let that dry. I'm using a small Japanese flush cutting saw here and protecting the top of the instrument using a piece of mylar. It's only about ten thousandths of an inch thick, so there won't be very much material left over after I'm done with this to sand off. Using a flat block here with some 80 grit. And then move on to 120 and 220 grit papers. After this, I'll apply a quick coat of Danish oil to darken the wood and make it blend in with the rest of the goosley. The underside poses a bit more of a challenge as this wood slab here curves up from the edge of the sound box. It's actually concave there, so I have to be a little more careful, but it's not too much of a problem. I'm using the two rulers as a guide to try and keep the new pins in line with the old ones. After I get those marked out, I'll take it over to the drill press and make the holes. I've got the box very carefully clamped to the table here because I'm drilling through end grain. I don't want the drill bit to wander at all and I want the holes to be exactly the right size. I then drilled a right angle hole through a block of wood here that's sized to fit the pin. This is a nice sliding fit. This is a positioning device that's going to keep the pin perpendicular to the top of the instrument as it's being installed. And for that reason it's also cut to be the correct height as well so that when I tap this pin into place it acts like a stop block for the hammer and um, it'll be the same height as the other pins around it. Yeah, this is a bit nerve wracking but uh, you're pounding into a portion of the instrument that's pretty solid. It's um, a solid piece of wood there. It's not like it's on top of the soundboard. I'm using the plastic faced hammer too just so I don't mar it. To confirm I had the right tuning I checked it out on Wikipedia there's E, A. Put it in H! Alright, I don't like this design, and I'll tell you why. If you decide to build one of these, don't use this system here. First of all, you've got these bridge pins are very crowded. They're close together, the holes are right on top of each other, and they're also very close to both ends. The main thing, though, is that these holes have been drilled cylindrical. Bridge pins are tapered in section and they really rely on having a similar taper on the hole. You get those uh, two surfaces locking together at a certain point. There's friction which holds them. In this case the string goes down that hole. Unlike a guitar, there's no ledge in there, no bridge pad for this to come up against. The ball end is normally hooked up against that and the bridge pin just sort of holds it in place. This is down there in the hole and the tension is basically pulling up. There's nothing to withstand that. And the main thing is, of course, that when you put this bridge pin in there, these must have been hammered in. I'm pretty sure of it, because in the cylindrical hole, only the top, maybe 32nd of an inch or so, is actually tight. I think these were driven in expecting the plastic to deform enough to hold in place. But when it comes time to switch strings, just, you know, good luck. We'll return to that in a moment. Let's move on. All right. Now we're going to do a little work on this banjo here. This is a Kevin Enoch, I believe it's a tradesman model, which is fretless. It's an old timey banjo. No resonator, no frets. This one is strung with nylon to mimic the old fashioned gut strung banjos of yore. And what this needs doing, um, the owner would like me to put some side dot markers on here. And the other thing is uh, we're going to do a scoop for the thumb. Now, I'm not a banjo player of any regard, but uh, doing claw hammer, old timey stuff, you know, your thumb, sort of, when you're frailing, can bump into the edge of the fingerboard. In this case, it's a fairly sharp corner here. And so what he would like me to do is produce a scoop uh, to provide some more clearance here, just on the, uh, the fifth string, so his thumb isn't bumping into the side of the neck when he's playing. So, um, oh, we're also going to change the head as well. So we got our work cut out for us. Nice change of pace. This has been recently restrung here. The owner would like to see if we can hold on to this set of nylon strings. If it was a steel string instrument, yeah, I'd say no. There's just there's no way it would go back together. But being that these are nylon, uh, I think we can probably make that work. This thing has got the no knot tailpiece on it. So uh, probably the best thing to do is just try to take the strings off with the tailpiece still attached. And just sort of tape this all together. Hope it stays. 
There are a lot of old-timey tunings, and it's a good idea to record the one that happens to be on the banjo that you're working on before you've taken the strings off it. E, C-sharp, F-sharp, B, C-sharp. Interesting. I bundled the strings up neatly and clamped them between two padded boards to try and keep them from getting messed up. Hmm, I was told this board was supposed to be rich light, but that looks like ebony to me. Maybe they changed the specs at some point. This is a 25 and a half inch scale, and I happen to have a fret ruler for that. So I'm just transferring the lines over to the side of the fretboard for the side dot markers. I'm going to position the dots right on the fret lines as opposed to halfway between them like you'd find on a regular banjo. That should make fingering less difficult. Recently I've seen some jigs online that are designed to make this an easier task, but I finally get pretty good results just doing it by eye. Now I'm going to carry the scoop to a depth of about, oh, close to around four millimeters. There's just going to be a little sort of sliver of um, black that continues on here. So for these three final ones, I'm just going to put them down here below. So I'm going to drill it, glue it, and clip it. You should know the drill by now. So I'll pare away the excess here, very lightly sand it, and apply a coat of lemon oil with the rest of the fingerboard, and that should take care of that. I looked through my collection of homemade routing templates and found one that would work as a nice right angle jig here. I'm super gluing it to the fretboard. Both pieces have masking tape on them. One of them has accelerator, and uh, that goes together pretty firmly. To make the scoop, I'm using a core box bit with a follower bearing on the shaft here. That seems like a suitable radius. This super glue technique for holding the template in place, yeah, you gotta know what you're doing. You can't have any kickback. You know, you have to know which way to feed the router, have to have an assured hand and a delicate touch. But um, it works fine if you're experienced. So there we are. I'm going to do a little sanding with paper wrapped around a half inch dowel. I think that's okay. I'm going to clean up the edge of the tone ring with a product called Never Dull, which is a cotton impregnated with some shiny stuff. This can has been in my family for 35 years. What I've had to do is put some glue around the circumference of the hole in there, trying to build it up a little bit more um, so that this pin has more to contact. And I'm going to get it tight, as tight as I can, and hopefully it locks in place, but can you, f you know, it's got to be that tight, which is bad, because that's putting a lot of pressure on the block. And I expect over time more cracks are going to develop in this. Let's see if I can tighten this up. That's what happens. In this case, it landed in the hole. The other base peg does the same thing as well. I just don't have it tightened up. Using a plain shaving and some glue, I filled it in and then reamed it out, trying to make it fit perfectly. This gentle viewer is a bad design. I've been fooling around with this thing for about two and a half hours off and on now. And I've got this fit as tight as it would ever possibly be fit. And I know it's going to pop. Eventually I came to the realization that these things had actually been glued in place. I re-glued them. So despite what I'm about to say, I did eventually manage to make this thing hold together. But what a chore. Yeah, it no, it's wrong. Some things are unfixable. This is unfixable. I can cut this thing off and make a bridge that will work, but it's going to cost more than this entire instrument. 
that annoys me. Because there are ways of doing this. You know, on that other one there was simple pins that had a groove around them that would be perfect for this. They're naturally designed for the function. This thing here, wrong. Not right. Easy there, bro. Just chill out, okay? Relax. <laughs>